It was easier than I thought to get into the truck, start the engine, and pull out of the driveway. I was leaving the home I had called my own for nine years with Connie. We bought it before our wedding and moved in after our honeymoon. Somehow I thought it would be more difficult to move on, as they say. Ten minutes later I was on the interstate, heading north. I was on I-45 heading to Dallas. There I would get on I-35 towards Auk, then on to Kansas City before turning north again. My destination was Minneapolis. I arranged the transfer, much to the displeasure of my boss. He warned me that in winter it could be cold there and I would have to clear the snow. I laughed and said that I was used to the cold. He looked at me and shrugged. I left town when I started thinking about what led to this. It all started a little over a year ago. A close friend, Connie, came to my office at the end of the workday. She said her car was being repaired and she needed a ride home. To tell the truth, I never needed this woman. I thought she was too demanding. In other words, she was a complete bitch. But I tolerated her because she had been my wife's best friend since elementary school. When we arrived at her house, she invited me to come in. I said, no thanks, because I needed to go home. She said she knew Connie was out of town, so I was in no rush. She offered to cook dinner. I knew something was wrong because she hates cooking. And as soon as she sat down on the seat, she began to slowly lift her skirt, continuing to invite me. Soon she showed me more than I needed to see. She noticed that she hated wearing panties and proved it. And when she lifted her skirt even higher, it became clear that she had recently gotten waxed. I told her it was time to go out. She pouted and said, I don't know what I'm missing. I just looked at her. Then she tried. Who will know? I replied, I will find out. With that, she gave in and smiled. Can't blame the girl for trying. She left and I drove away without looking back. I guess I should have realized then that it wasn't over, but I was too stupid to think about it. I wasn't going to tell Connie, but I decided not to fall for Anna's tricks anymore. This is what started my journey. I looked around. I just turned 34 years old. I was six feet tall, although in reality it was a little less, but I still said six feet. I weighed about 200 pounds and could lose about 10. My hair is short but still brown, as are my eyes. I guess I'm not that bad looking, and I always considered myself lucky to have Connie. She was a real beauty. She was a little less beautiful. Long dark hair, dark eyes, full red lips, and a body that was just perfect. Breasts that made me drool, and an ass that I couldn't keep my hands off. She was still beautiful, but I felt so far away from her. She was more like a stranger or a TV character I've known for years, so I left her. Only physically, because I'm not done mourning my lost love. I always thought that we would grow old together and die in each other's arms. But this was not destined to happen. But since a big part of me had died, it didn't feel like as much of a loss as it could have been. With nothing to do but drive, I allowed my mind to recreate the events, thinking maybe I could have done things differently. Six months have passed since that April day when I dropped Anna off at home. Connie came home angrier than I've ever seen her. I asked what the problem was, and she just looked at me. Without saying a word, she went into the bedroom and slammed the door. It was a little unusual, but not completely out of the ordinary. Connie had a temper, but she usually took her rage out on me straight away. She didn't leave the bedroom for more than an hour. When I went to check on her, she was in her nightgown, sitting at her dressing table, combing her hair. Seeing me in the reflection, she demanded that I leave. Not wanting to stay where I wasn't welcome, I packed my things for the next day and left. I slept in the guest room, believing Connie would come for me. That would be a mixed blessing. If she came, it would be to express dissatisfaction. I went to work without hearing a word from her. I called her twice, but she didn't answer even once. I knew she had a caller ID and felt like when she saw my number, she sent the call to voicemail. That was fine, but she would have known I called. I got home earlier that evening than she did, but that didn't surprise me. When she didn't come until 9, I tried to call her cell phone. I left a message and started to get angry. At 11 I was trying to sleep when my phone rang. It was Connie. She was drunk. This was obvious from her speech. 
In short phrases, she told me that she would not come home that evening. She drank too much and stayed with a friend. This pissed me off, but she hung up before I could say anything. I stood up and waited a little, not knowing what to do. At midnight I tried to call her again, and the call went straight to voicemail. I was not only angry, but also upset, but there was nothing I could do about it. The next day at the office everyone probably noticed my mood. That night I stopped for a drink. I was also going to come late, so it was, I arrived at midnight. I found Connie's car in the garage, and the engine was cold. I knew that she arrived at least an hour before me. I walked in expecting a scene, but nothing happened. The house was dark. I found the bedroom by touch. The door was locked. Feeling drunk and tired, I lay down on the guest bed. I woke up a little late this morning and found that I was alone. Connie has already left. Luckily, it was Friday morning. I arrived at work a little late and did my best to get through the day. I didn't call Connie, but I called a friend who worked with her to make sure she showed up. All he could confirm was that her car was in the parking lot. On Friday evening, when I returned home, she was waiting for me. She had a glass of wine and a sober expression on her face. I was met with, we need to talk. As most married men will attest, this means she is going to talk and you are going to listen carefully. She began, is there something you want to tell me? Well, yes, it was, but I didn't think it was the right time to tell her she was being a bitch. I also remembered the old saying, I'll wait for her to tell me what I did wrong, I'm not going to admit to something she doesn't already know. When I remained silent, she continued, I didn't think you'd admit it yourself, but I know all about it. You can't hide it anymore. I never thought you would betray me like this. Now I was stumped. What the hell did I do? I tried desperately to remember. I didn't buy anything expensive. I wasn't planning a fishing trip to the bay. I thought about the date, it wasn't her birthday or our anniversary. And what did she mean by betrayed her? I had several nude photos of her, but I didn't show them to anyone's shaft. Thinking of making up a lie to get out of this? I looked at my wife of eight years and shrugged. I would think about it if I knew what to confess. Oh, come on, Martin. Remember, you thought you got away with it, didn't you? What did you get away with? Enough nonsense. You know what I'm talking about. I have no idea, and if you keep talking in riddles, I'll go and get drunk. Damn it. You're going to stay here until you confess and explain why. Why what? Why did you do that, bastard? What do you think? The word bastard made it clear that she was really serious. But what did I have to confess? What have I done? I know I can be an insensitive jerk, but all men can be like that. What am I missing? I tried to remain calm. Did what? I can't apologize until I know what my fault was. Oh, mister, an apology won't fix this. Damn, this is going to cost me, I thought. What will it take then, I asked. I don't know yet, but it will be expensive, maybe even cost our marriage. This caught my attention. This was serious. I started to think, what the hell did I do? Whatever it was, I didn't plan for it to go this way. She saw what I was thinking and frowned. Her anger flared again. Before I could speak again, she spilled everything. You thought you could sleep with my best friend and get away with it. Anne is too precious to me to let that happen. She told me everything. I know what you did, and I wonder how many more cases like this I've heard about. Don't know. I just looked at her like she was crazy. This only made her angrier. You bastard. You gave Anne a ride home and wanted a little reward as you put it. You followed her to the door and broke in after her. She didn't want it, but she thought it was better than ruining me by accusing you of attack. I was shocked. I remembered giving Anne a ride home, but even after her offer, I ignored it. Damn it, I forgot about that rag. As you can imagine, the rest of the weekend went from bad to worse. There were screams, threats, tears, and mutual insults. I was only guilty of a few insults, but I still supported my side in the battle. For three months we slept in separate beds. We only had corridor sex. This is when, passing each other in the corridor, she said to me, Fuck you. 
I was on edge and contacted a divorce lawyer. One friend used his services for his divorce. The lawyer's name was Jerry Lewis, but believe me, he was no comedian. His wife robbed him greatly in the divorce, and he used every case to take revenge on the female sex. I was about to propose a divorce when Connie came to me one night and said it was time to make peace. Our marriage was too important to continue living the way we were living. She declared a truce and suggested sharing the bedroom again. I felt a little better, but some of the damage had already been done. After that, nothing was the same. It was not peace, but rather a truce. We both felt it. And then one night it happened. It was Friday and Connie didn't come home. I received a call at midnight saying she would be spending the night away from home. I didn't argue and accepted it. This was the second blow. Connie returned home only at noon. She was wearing shorts, a blouse and sandals. She had a sports bag in her hand. She seemed happy, as if nothing had happened, and it was normal. She went to the bathroom and took a shower. With the door closed, I checked my bag. Inside was an evening dress, heels, stockings, a garter belt, a lace push-up bra makeup, but no panties. Well, that's not entirely true. There were panties in a plastic bag with her work clothes from Friday. I thought about what this could mean. I started imagining all sorts of things. And I mean all sorts. Not only bad things, but maybe there was some kind of office party and it went. She didn't invite me simply out of anger. She had her ways, but I still loved her despite them all. When she arrived in the kitchen, she smiled. Thanks for helping me unpack. I took this as a sign that she wanted to tell me what happened, so I asked. Connie blushed and tried to look flirtatious. Well, to be completely honest, I had a date. Date, I shouted. Yes, a date, and I won't lie about it like you do. What the hell do you mean? This is true, she answered. Fair? Yeah, you slept with Anne, so I got my chance. Woman. I told you nothing happened to Anne. I don't know why you don't believe me. Keep lying, but I won't. I had a great date. Dinner, dancing. You know, you haven't taken me dancing in years, but where was I? Yes, after the dance we went to his place. He was a real gentleman. Gentleman? Yes, he was gentle and took his time. He made me feel like a woman again. He made love to me all night. I don't want to listen to this. I said this, but I was still sitting at the table. I just wanted her to stop talking. Connie knew she had found my pain point. Yes, he was a great lover. He took care of me in every way. He was really good at sex. Maybe he could give you some advice. But he has a lot more than you, so I felt him in places that you have never achieved. I don't want to listen to this, I shouted. Why not? Don't you want to know that another man can satisfy me better than you? I just don't. What have you done? I asked in a cold voice. I even the score. How does it feel? I covered my face with my hands and said, I think I'm going to be sick. And I actually felt sick. I had to run to the bathroom because I felt like I was going to throw up. I didn't vomit, and after an hour the feeling went away. I washed my face and left the bathroom. I took the beer and went out into the backyard. I was sitting watching the sunset when Connie appeared. I didn't notice it at first. I finally noticed her when she spoke. Isn't a sunset beautiful? It marks the end of the day and the promise of a new tomorrow. I flinched when she spoke because I was a little nervous. I just looked at her and then looked back at the last ray of sun. Yes, let's make this the end of our problems. We can put them behind us and tomorrow our new day will begin. I looked at this woman again. I saw her in a different light. How could she be so casual after what she did? Connie drank wine. Think, we need to make new vows to each other and then go to bed and seal them. I thought it was funny and I laughed for the first time in many hours. What's so funny? She demanded in a sharp tone. Oh, I don't know. Let's see, new vows. Why? You didn't fulfill the previous ones. Well, bastard. You didn't fulfill it either. I just looked at her with such hatred as I had never felt before. Do not look at me. Then her voice softened. I still love you and I want all this to be behind me. 
Go to bed. I need you and I want you. Damn it, you're crazy, woman. It's woman again. What does this mean, Martin Raymond Jameson? Connie went into mother mode, using all three of my names. She knew it made me angry. That means I'm not going to go to bed with you. Go back to your Mr. D Big. You said you liked him better than me. I love you, Martin. I just had sex with. Her voice trailed off. Get all your sex from him. Oh, I understand. I took a bath, you know. I'm clean. I stood up and headed to the bedroom. She followed me. I think she thought we would fall into bed and make passionate love, but that didn't happen. I gathered most of my things and took them to the guest room. She followed me, cursing, but I ignored her. Then I moved my things from the bathroom. As you can imagine, it was a cold Saturday night in Houston and an even colder Sunday. I accepted the facts and went to work. It was time to do something. I worked on the translation and turned it over to lawyer Jerry Lewis. I'm sure he was delighted with the matter. That was a little over two weeks ago, and now I'm heading to Minneapolis alone. The road was lonely, and I felt the loss more than I could have ever imagined. I had planned to drive all the way to Kansas before stopping, but decided to go straight instead. It wasn't because I wanted to, but because I was afraid that if I stopped, I might change my mind and turn back in the morning. Nights, sleepless nights can be so difficult for a person. Arriving in the city twenty hours later, I was ready to sleep. I found a hotel and checked in. It was Saturday, so I paid for two days. I wasn't supposed to be in the office for a week, but I didn't want to sit in a hotel. Everyone in the office was surprised to hear that I was leaving alone. They offered to have a farewell dinner for Connie and I, but they understood when I explained. I was a little surprised that the news didn't get to Connie, but she was actually surprised when I left. I had planned to leave before she got home, but due to a last-minute sale and her arriving a little early, I had to deal with her. I checked my phone but knew there would be no call. I bought a cheap mobile phone and transferred my number to it. Then I got a new number for the iPhone that I carried with me. I left my old phone hidden under the sofa in the living room. If Connie tries to call, she will find him. I smiled, but it was a sad smile, wondering if she tried. Maybe she was in Mr. Big's bed while I was sitting in a hotel up north. I had to push that thought away. Having nothing better to do, I went looking for a new office. Finding it turned out to be easier than I thought. I thought all cities were like Houston, but it turns out they aren't. At dinner, eating alone, I realized that I needed a place to live. An apartment will do. Hopefully at least partially furnished. Monday came and I was sad. I thought leaving Connie would make it easier, but it turned out differently. It's hard to explain, even though I was angry at her, it was comforting to know she was in the house. I had to come to terms with it, so I did everything I could and went to work. They were waiting for me, but not in the morning. I met my boss Bill and his secretary Jackie. Jackie was an attractive woman, perhaps in her fifties. She dressed well and was very professional. It was not only her smile that caught my attention, but also the stone on her ring finger. I noticed it not because I liked it, but because of its size. If he was real, a man who could afford him would not need her income. As it turned out, she was married to a very wealthy man who allowed her to keep her job. She worked for the company for over 15 years. She took over the position when her children entered high school. Bill asked if I had found a place to live. I answered no. He asked if I wanted Jackie to find options for me. I was surprised by what she had prepared for 1000 p.m. Taking the brochures, I noticed that she had a daughter about my age who could show me around the city. I thanked her but told her I was married. Jackie looked at me strangely and then smiled. I thought she was offended, but it turned out that she knew about my impending divorce and realized that it was a topic I did not want to discuss. If they need to verify your employment, Here's my business card with a direct number. Most of them are new complexes, and they need tenants, but they can still check. I went and rented a one-room apartment on the fourth floor at the second viewing. It was unfurnished, but there was a company that could furnish it and rent out or sell whatever they brought. I had a daily allowance and paid for everything. 
I was settled in for Wednesday and ready to go. The following Thursday, Connie found me. She was a dissatisfied woman by then. She received documents about the upcoming divorce. I listened to the insults and tried not to respond in the same spirit. I was at my new workplace and didn't want to air my dirty laundry in front of my new colleagues. And one more thing. It took me about 40 calls before I found the damn phone under the sofa. You can be very sneaky sometimes. Then on Tuesday at the office they handed me the documents. I only found you when my lawyer asked for your address to serve you with a summons. I'm filing a counterclaim, you, you perverted bastard. But that wasn't the hardest thing for me. The killer part was when she burst into tears. I knew I still had feelings for her, but not the same as before. However, it pained me to see her suffer. Luckily, my lawyer delayed serving the summons. He said he represented me in Texas, and since I was out of state, everything had to go through him. He kept me informed and enjoyed making Connie crazy. I found the people in Minnesota different. Not bad, just different. In the far north, people are enjoying the warm months as best they can. The only exception was that all the pools were indoors. But otherwise people used parks and baseball fields until late at night, especially in the summer when children are out of school. I started walking to work. It was a little over a mile. On the first day, I regretted the decision before halfway through. When they found out that I was walking, I expected ridicule about the lack of money for gasoline, but this did not happen. By the second week, I was already enjoying my walks. Our watch gave for the arrival of spring and the departure of summer. It was already cold, although it was only the end of September. I was walking down the hallway towards my door when a woman came out of her apartment, almost colliding with me. All I remember is that she was wearing a small swimsuit, and it barely covered it, but I wasn't complaining. Oh, sorry, I was going swimming. I guess I should have put on a robe. She smiled, and the corridor lit up. I didn't know what to say. I just stared as if I had never seen a woman. See you there? she asked. I didn't plan, he tried to smile, looking at the two bulges covered with bright fabric. Maybe next time. And she left. I probably looked like a fool. I just stood and watched. She never put on her robe, just threw it over her shoulder. I looked at the swing of her hips and her shapely ass, with my mouth open. When she turned the corner, I walked towards my door. Then I felt stupid. I thought about her when I opened the door. I had just walked in when the phone rang. I was on duty, so I grabbed it. I think it will be a surprise, I heard Connie say. Yes, I suppose so. How are you? I asked, not knowing what else to say. Do you really care? And the question wasn't sarcastic, which hurt me. Yes, in a way. I'm not doing well. I miss you and I want you back. I just got your number. It took me so long to find you. I love you, Martin, and I'm so sorry. Can't we work this out? I promise I'll fix everything. I heard her crying quietly. Let me think. I just don't know. A lot of water has passed under the bridge since then. Not as much as in our marriage. I was caught. I could only promise to think about it and call her. She still had our old number and cell phone so I knew them by heart. We talked some more and laughed. It was pleasant, but also painful. It reminded me of what I had lost. I hung up, promising to call back within a week. I was tormented for the next few days, and most of the staff noticed it. Finally, on the sixth day, I called. It was difficult, but I told Connie that it would be better to get a divorce. She took it better than I expected. I was relieved on Wednesday when I hung up. It was over. On Friday, I came home. As I walked around the corner from the elevator to my door, I saw Connie sitting on her suitcase in front of my door. She didn't look happy. I walked towards her. The distance was over a hundred feet, but I would have preferred it to have been a mile. When she saw me, her face lit up. What are you doing here? I asked, but not angrily. I just had to come. I still love you, and I think you still love me. I couldn't leave this without one last try. I looked around. Let's go inside. That's fine with me. I think we need some privacy. As she said this, she looked down the hall. I followed her gaze, but saw nothing. Inside, she tried to kiss me, 
but it just didn't feel right. She didn't like it. What's wrong? I have bad breath. No, it's just, it doesn't feel right. Are you feeling right with that red-headed bitch? I just looked at her. I was stunned because I didn't know who she was talking about. Who? Oh, you know, hallway matron. I wrinkled my face, corridor matron. Don't play the fool with me. That long-legged, big-breasted bitch who came to ask me why I'm sitting in front of your door. No, she said, why are you sitting in front of Martin's door? If you don't know her, how did I recognize your name? I still didn't know who she was talking about, but I walked towards the door. I opened it and called Connie. See, my name is on the door here. Well, she knew you anyway, and when I told her I was your wife, she, well, you could see it on her face. You won't see her again. I haven't seen her anyway, I said with a raised voice. If you don't know her, how do you know you didn't sleep with her, Mr. Jameson? I didn't answer. But I knew because I didn't have a sex life. But I wasn't going to admit it. The night didn't go well. She slept in my bed, I on the sofa. We talked, argued, and quarreled the entire next day. I'm sure everyone in the hallway or in the next apartment knew about the argument, but perhaps not all the words were said. Finally, on Saturday afternoon, I sat Connie down. We both calmed down a little. She asked me to forgive her, and I tried to explain. Connie, I have forgiven you. I did that a while ago. If you forgave me, why didn't you come home? It is true, I can forgive, but the damage is done. Let me explain. You took my most valuable treasure and broke it. Whether it was in anger or by mistake, it does not matter. The treasure is destroyed. I can forgive you even for an intentional action because I know it was anger, not revenge. She smiled and tried to speak. I raised my hand to continue. As I said, my treasure was destroyed, no, I should say broken. Then you tried to glue it back together. Perhaps it could serve its purpose, but every time I saw it, I would remember how it was broken, and it would never be the same. So you haven't forgiven me, Connie started crying. It hurt me. I hugged her and told her I forgave her. But the damage was done and could not be undone. What we had was special, and when it happened between us, that feeling disappeared. I care about you deeply, but it's better for us to leave. I don't want to experience this sadness every day. Connie held back her tears. I understand. When, his touch and everything just wasn't you, Martin. And when, too. When I was with him, it just wasn't the same. Here it was not what she said, but how. I knew she had done more than just hold Roger's hand. It hurt, and I regretted knowing his name. Martin, I went into it with the intention. But I couldn't. I thought about you. And it didn't. It wasn't the same. So you understand what I mean? I asked, not wanting to go deeper into this topic. Yes, but trust me, I'm telling the truth. Nothing happened. Connie said this before bursting into tears again. I hugged her with a broken heart. I felt all the pain again. At that moment, the truth didn't matter. It was over and done. The damage was done. I knew in my heart that she slept with Mr. Big or Roger. But I wasn't angry, I was hurt. I drove Connie to the airport on Saturday night and walked her through security. Then I went home. I felt tired, exhausted, and empty. I walked down the corridor to my door. It felt like the hundred miles I had dreamed of last Friday afternoon. I was just a few doors away from my apartment when she came out. It stunned me. I stopped in place and looked at her. It was the same woman I saw in a swimsuit. I looked her up and down. Only then did I notice that she had red hair. I look so bad, she smiled. Sorry. I was just lost in my thoughts. You scared me and I had to remember where I was. Looks like you need a friend. Come in and sit down for a minute. I don't think you should be alone. I looked at her, then at her door. I saw a name on the door, Katie Taylor. How many times have I passed her door and not read it, even after seeing her in a swimsuit? I followed her to her apartment, mostly because I didn't want to be haunted by Connie's ghost in mine. Katie had a cozy apartment, not only in temperature, 
but also in atmosphere. A few minutes later, we were already drinking wine. I looked into the beautiful green eyes and asked, Are you the same hallway matron? She smiled and said, I'm sorry. The wine began to work. You may not know it, but Connie called you a bitch. I don't really know why I said it, but I did. Guilty again, she smiled over her glass. I hope this doesn't make you think less of me. No, not at all, but I can't say the same about my future ex-wife. It doesn't matter, she smiled again. I just looked at her smile and felt warmth throughout my body. Thinking it was wine, I just accepted it. The next thing I remember is the smell of coffee and bacon. I was hungry because I hadn't eaten all Saturday. I looked around. I wasn't in my bed. I was only wearing shorts and a t-shirt. I looked at the other side of the bed. It was untouched, and my trousers and shirt lay at the foot of it. It took me a minute to realize where I was. This was Katie's bedroom. At that moment she entered the room. She looked cheerful, with bright eyes, and that same gorgeous smile. When I felt the warmth again, I realized that it was not the wine that I felt the previous evening. It's good that you woke up. If the coffee and bacon hadn't woken you up, I would have called the paramedics. Where did you sleep? I was confused. On the couch. I like women, so you were safe. She smiled again. Just kidding, I slept on top of you all night. I didn't know what to say. Her smile still lit up the room. Mom said the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. I always thought otherwise. But since you got up for food, I'll have to reconsider. The bathroom is there. I put away my tights, panties, and bras. You'll be safe. While I'm making breakfast, I hope bacon, eggs, and toast will do. It felt strange to shower in her bathroom, but the water was refreshing. I went out, dried myself, and put on the same clothes, but I still felt better. We talked at the table. Katie was easy to talk to and be around. She apologized for putting me in her bed, but decided it was easier than dragging me home, and she assured me that women were not people. Not that there's anything wrong with that, she stated. The day went well, and I felt better. When evening came, I went to my room to change clothes and take her to dinner. I found a dozen calls from Connie on voicemail. I ignored them. On Tuesday, I received a call from my lawyer. Connie decided to play hardball, he said. I told him about my suspicions that she was having an affair with a man named Roger. This didn't surprise him. Roger Smith, he asked. All I knew was the name Roger. Jerry told me that they checked Connie's phone records for the last six months and found many calls to a number belonging to Roger Smith, the man who was Ann Barton's immediate superior. After that he told me not to worry. Thinking that the lawyer's tactics would make me come to my senses, Connie stopped calling. I was glad about it and happy to be away. A month passed before I found out what had happened. My lawyer, Mr. Jerry Lewis, cornered theme. He took statements from Connie and Ann. I was supposed to be interviewed next week. Under oath, during interrogation, Connie stated that she did not commit adultery, and it was just a story to make me think that she did. Ann confirmed that we had a sexual relationship. None of the women's testimony was challenged by my lawyer. At that moment, he took out his laptop and played the video. I was smart enough to use my iPhone to record Connie's vivid description of her date. Jerry asked her, Are you saying it was all made up? Connie blushed. Yeah, I just wanted him to feel what I felt. You mean it wasn't true? Yes. Then why didn't you tell him right away? Why didn't you explain that it was fiction? I couldn't. I was too angry. I wanted him to suffer. And you think that's fair? Yes. Anne confirmed that Martin never propositioned her for sex and that she just wanted to help her friend. With that, Jerry proposed a deal. Connie had to agree to a divorce without alimony, and they both had to pay half of his fee. After an hour of discussion, Connie agreed to my lawyer's terms. To make matters worse, Jerry made his fee payable to Connie. Disputes began about how exactly Anne and Connie would pay their shares. I must admit that I was impressed with my lawyer and felt rewarded. Jerry had Connie sign the agreement that same day. 
he said he would send it to me for review. If everything is in order, he will submit documents to the court. This will take about a week, two at most. But he didn't wait at all. I received the documents by ten in the morning the next day. I waited at FedEx. I trusted him, so I just signed it and sent it back. He received them by 4 p.m. that same day. By six in the evening I was divorced. I waited in the office and received his fax. I will receive the official maternity leave in a week by registered mail. The divorce was final on Wednesday, and I wanted to celebrate a little on Thursday night. I thought who better to do this than Katie. We were at my house and almost ready to go when the phone rang. I was in the bathroom so I asked Katie to answer if it was work. As I walked out, I heard part of Katie's conversation. Who am I? I thought you remembered me. I'm the corridor matron. There was silence. I couldn't make out the words, but it was clear from the voice that they were shouting at the other end of the line. Glad to hear from you. Yes, that's nice. Now, how can I help? More screams. I just stood there trying to understand what was happening. Well, I can call him if you want. Oh, wait, he just got out of the shower. A short pause. Martin, you could at least wrap yourself in a towel. You're embarrassing me. Yes, Connie, I think he can talk to you now. Katie covered the receiver with her hand. Sorry, but the bitch gets out sometimes, she whispered with a sinister smile. I picked up the phone and smiled. He held it away from his face and said loud enough to be heard over the phone, Why are you embarrassed? You're naked too. Then he said, Hi. Connie attacked me with a stream of curses. I kept the phone away from my ear. Katie ran her finger over her other finger, whispering, Shame on you, while trying not to laugh. Connie said we were still married, and she changed her mind. She was going to come and make me realize that she still loved me. She commented on the redhead with a snide remark that this woman is a destroyer of families. When I finally got a word in edgewise and explained that we were divorced, she didn't believe me. I told her to check, but as far as I was concerned, we were done. She repeated the threat to come. I finally said goodbye while she was still screaming. Damn, it felt good, well, at least for a minute. But then it hit me a little harder. Katie seemed to understand. We went to dinner and then came back to her place. She said it might be better if I moved to another apartment. She offered to take care of it in the morning while I was at work. I found out she was working as an assistant manager to lower her rent. So the next day I was in the apartment next to her. We shared a balcony, but she said I was safe. There was a 30-inch high metal railing between the two landings. The next day I received a call on my mobile. Connie was sitting in front of my old door. The manager, knowing the situation, showed her an empty apartment and swore that he did not know where I had moved. I was later told that this was not entirely a lie because Kathy had not yet changed the papers. Connie was not going to give up and said that she would wait for the hallway inspector and sat down near Katie's door. It took a manager, security and police to force her to leave. That night I snuck in and went up. I knocked on Katie's door to ask if I had moved. She gave me a new key and then handed me a basket of clean clothes. How embarrassing, she washed my clothes, including my underwear. I commented that I didn't buy a washer and dryer because there was a laundry room in the basement. Why buy when you can rent, I joked. Katie smiled. I think it's better to own one. You don't know what was in the cars down there, and you won't find someone else's sock in your car, she replied. Somehow it seems to me that she didn't talk about the washing machine but she offered to use hers any time I needed. I suggested we have dinner again, but she said that we had already been to the restaurant the day before. She cooked dinner. Well, actually, she just put it together. We ate salad and sandwiches. She really decorated them beautifully, and they were delicious. Later in the evening, we sat on the balcony and watched the light snow begin to fall. It turned into a storm that delayed all the planes. Connie was stuck at the airport for 36 hours. Until now, Katie and I had not been close. I kissed her, but that was all. I enjoyed her company and thought about her often. I was just afraid that I wasn't ready for a relationship yet. 
Three weeks passed, and I invited Katie to a company Christmas party. She looked amazing. She wore a black sequined dress that hugged her body. It reached to her ankles, but was cut at the sides to reveal black stockings. Her feet were wearing high-heeled shoes, and her hair was tied up. Her makeup looked professional. She wore a diamond pendant and matching earrings. I just looked at her and whistled. You're gorgeous. I hope I can keep you at the party. I had to explain myself. I knew there would be several men at the party with much more charm and proposals for her. She smiled and took it as a compliment and said, You look good too. We arrived at the party. When she saw where I worked, she laughed. I didn't know you worked for Tate Pressure Controls. My mom works here too. You know, she's always trying to set me up with the guy she works with. If we see her and she drags him in, I'll be so embarrassed. I realized that we never discussed our jobs. Where do you work? I work for Stillman. They are one of our suppliers. It's a small world. I work in the accounts payable department. It's not much fun, and my corner doesn't have a window. She laughed with that, and it warmed me up. At that moment, I saw my boss. I took Katie to him. Hi, Bill. I'd like to introduce Katie Taylor. Kathy, this is Bill Green, my boss and I'm sorry I wasn't introduced to your wife. Bill smiled. Katie, what a surprise. Hi, Bill. Nice to see you again. Fran, how are the children? Katie answered. I felt like I was missing something. And then another shock awaited me. Jackie walked over and hugged Katie. I was introduced to Rick Taylor, Jackie's husband. Everyone seemed to know Katie. A minute later, Katie whispered something to Jackie. Jackie started laughing. This stunned Katie and caught everyone's attention. Jackie took her husband's arm and apologized. A minute later, Bill and his wife were busy talking to another couple. I just had to ask what it was about. Katie looked into my eyes. She didn't say a word, just led me to a secluded area near the dance floor. It was my mom, and I told her not to bring this guy from her office. I wanted her to know that I had a date and didn't need help. She just burst out laughing and took Dad away. I'll deal with this. It dawned on me. Jackie offered to help her daughter show me around. The same Jackie who arranged for her daughter. Katie noticed that I was thinking and asked, What are you thinking about? Tell me, do you have a sister? No, just me and my brother, but we lost him to cancer about ten years ago. I heard the pain in her voice. Sorry. I hope I didn't ruin the evening. She smiled. You didn't spoil it, and I hope Mom doesn't ruin it. I wouldn't be surprised if she brought this guy in just so I could have a choice, as she would say. I remembered too many times when Jackie tried to get me to call my daughter. Now I was with that same woman. It was funny, but I could be wrong. Or Jackie could have more than one man in mind for her Katie. I decided to keep my thoughts to myself. I'll wait to see what the night brings. A few minutes later, the music started playing. I'm not a great dancer, and I warned Katie about this, but she still went on the dance floor with me. I held her while eating and slowly moving along the floor. I don't know how good we looked, but we both liked it. During dinner, we sat with my boss and his wife. Also at the table were Jackie, Rick, and Mr. Diff, and Mrs. Chapman. Charles Chapman is our division president. I've never met him, but I've seen his photo many times. Everyone seemed to know Katie, and she knew them. I was a stranger in this group. Throughout the evening, I noticed Jackie looking at me or Katie and smiling or laughing while sipping champagne. But I noticed more. I saw the love between Jackie and Rick. I watched closely from the table. Jackie listened to her husband's every word. He was just as committed to her words. They often touched each other. One way I noticed was when Rick was talking she would hug his upper right arm. She interlocked her fingers and laid her head on his shoulder. He covered her left hand with his. When he did this, he opened his palm and spread his ring and index fingers to reveal her wedding ring. His gold ring touched her stone. He may have done this because the stone was so big, but I think it was more to show their union. They always seemed to be touching each other. She might stroke his hand or hold his hand or he was looking for her hand. 
It was as if there was a neon sign above them declaring their love. I envied them. I looked and saw what life could be. I had to admit that it could have just been for show or temporary, but I'd bet it wasn't. I looked for so long that my companion noticed my distraction. Katie stood up to go to the ladies' room. Jackie and Fran went with her. When Katie returned, I stood up to help her sit up. Instead, she smiled at me. It warmed me to the core. She took my hand and led me to the dance floor. She disappeared into my arms. After a minute, she looked up and asked, Can I tell you something without you getting mad? Of course, why should I be angry? Unless you say you met an old boyfriend and want to go home with him. I was half joking, but in reality I was afraid that she was too good to be true. Katie pulled away from me and looked straight into my eyes. With a serious face, she said in a serious tone, I am here with the man I chose. She then relaxed and laid her head back on my shoulder. What I wanted to say, before I was interrupted, she wasn't angry. My mother confessed, you're the man she wanted me to meet. I couldn't believe my ears and thought about what we both said. I mean that my boss's secretary wanted to set me up with her daughter, and Katie talks about how her mom always finds her a boyfriend, but we both thought it was funny. I'm glad I met you, Katie. I only regret that I didn't agree to your mom's proposal on that first day. I was sincere in my words. We danced some more and I was captivated by her charms. After a few minutes, she whispered, What were you so busy at the table? I answered honestly without thinking. Later I realized how comfortable I felt with her. I was a little jealous watching Jackie and your dad. I felt her tense up a little. I didn't know you liked older women. This is not your mother. I'm jealous of your father. Now it sounded funny. I understood how this could be perceived. I mean, I'm jealous of the love he has for your mom. So you're not gay, she laughed. No, not at all, and I'm surprised that you can't understand it. I can understand it because I feel it in my tummy, and it feels really good. I see what I'm missing by not having a woman who loves me the way your mother loves your father, or love the way he loves your mother. I want a woman like her. She looked at me with her beautiful green eyes, even when the bitch in her sometimes comes out. I smiled at her and lightly kissed her forehead as long as it's directed in the right way. We continued to dance to the music, and I could feel her soft breathing as her chest rose and fell against me. I know, but sometimes. What if? She asked quietly. Even then, what more can I ask for? I want you. I want to know you. All of you. And I want to get to know you. I want to be everything to you. Everyone. Yes, your woman, your bitch, she whispered. Then she continued, your lady and your lover, your slave and your queen, your friend and the one with whom you share your hopes, sorrows, joys and dreams. I want to be the one you wake up with and the one you kiss goodnight. I was stunned and flattered. I had strong feelings for Katie, I realized that. That's why I never tried to get her to bed. But at that moment I felt a burning desire. I looked at her. I like the list, but you forgot something. She thought for a minute. Wife, you forgot your wife. Our dance stopped and we kissed. We were still kissing when the music stopped and the dancers started clapping. This broke our kiss and we looked back to see many smiling at us. I took her hand and we found a secluded place behind a flower pot. I kissed her again. I was almost out of breath. I wanted her so much. I want to take you home, rip your panties off and make love to you. She looked up and said, You can't do this tonight. I thought, Great, she's on her period. You can't do this because I'm not wearing any panties. It had an immediate effect on me. I ran my hand over her butt. Indeed, I did not feel anything under the thin fabric. I raised my hand, and when I reached the back, she smiled. And there's no bra either. I kissed her deeply, and she responded. After the kiss, I looked into her eyes. Are you saying that between me and you now there is only this thin dress? And your clothes, she reminded. By then the music had stopped. The orchestra was taking a break. 
we returned to the table. Her mother looked up with a slight smile. Oh, there you are. We thought we would have to send out a search party. Everyone at the table laughed as if they knew why we were gone. Something has changed. As we listened to the conversation at the table, I felt Katie's touch. She did many of the same things her mother did. I wondered if it was instinct or learned. I didn't care, I just wanted her touch. And I wanted to touch her. We often held hands on the table, sometimes intertwining our fingers. At the end of the evening, Jackie made a final toast. For mothers, they sometimes know what they're talking about. She looked straight at Katie as she said those words. Everyone at the table agreed, raising their last glasses. Katie hugged everyone at the table, and I shook hands with all the men. We went to pick up my truck. I used valet parking. When he pulled up and held the door for me, I ignored him. I walked around the truck and opened the door for Katie. I helped her sit down and even fasten his seat belt. I took time for a kiss. I wanted to leave for several reasons. One was the line of people behind us waiting for their cars, and the other was my desire to be alone with her. I tipped the valet and off we went. We had barely left the area when I felt her hand on my leg. I really enjoyed this evening. I don't want it to end. I took her home. She didn't say a word as I stopped at my door and led her inside. A moment later we found ourselves in a dark bedroom. I took off her dress and saw her naked body in the dim light. I kissed her while my hands explored her body. She was also busy unbuttoning my shirt and unbuttoning my pants. I had to break the kiss to take off my clothes. I won't go into details of our night, it's too personal. Let me just say that we have expressed our love more times than I have fingers on my hands. We fell asleep closer to morning. I woke up seeing her next to me. I kissed her tenderly and ran my hands over her naked body, covered only by the sheet. After that we made love again. Lying together afterwards, I made a startling discovery. She began, It was so wonderful. I never thought it would be so, so satisfying. I had to ask, What do you mean? She smiled at me, I have never felt a man. Have you never had sex? Not in this case. I had sex but never loved. With the few men, just three, that I had, I never let them. I demanded that they wear a condom. But I didn't. I know, and I didn't want you to do this, she sighed and pressed herself closer to me. Are you on birth control or something? No, I never wanted to risk it. I want children. Katie, we just, I did it. What if? I hope you did, because I want your baby she sang. What will your parents think? I don't care, because now I'm your woman. Get up right now and get yourself in order. We need to do something. I think she was a little offended, but she stood up. We showered together to save water, of course, and then got dressed. She didn't ask where we were going. I saw the joy in her eyes when we arrived at the jewelry store. I let her choose the ring and the price was not an issue. She was a little embarrassed when I didn't let her put it on, but took the box and put it in my pocket. Now call your parents and ask if we can come over. While we were driving to her parents, I let her look at the ring. A few minutes later, we were at their door. Jackie and Rick met us. We were in the living room when I started. Mr. and Mrs. Der Taylor, I come with a confession and a question. All three in the room exchanged glances. Last night I'm afraid I took advantage of the situation. I should have abstained, but I didn't. I should have been correct and respectful and taken Katie home. To her house, I didn't do it. I'm afraid I've dishonored her. I value her very much and do not want her or our child to be disgraced by my actions. So I have come to ask your permission to ask Katie to marry me. This stunned everyone. I explained. I will ask for her hand only with your blessing. Jackie spoke up. I believe this decision will be Katie's, but we both thank you for wanting our blessing. Now, if possible, let me take my daughter for a moment. She stood up and called Katie into the other room. A minute later they called Rick. I sat in the room wondering what I was doing. We didn't have to wait long. Rick came back to me. Martin, as far as Jackie and I are concerned, you have our blessing. 
but we'd like. I was waiting for the shoe to drop. We would like you to leave her with us and come back tomorrow to ask for her. If you do this, please wear a suit. And of course, there may be a celebration. With these words, I was escorted to the door. I thought about the suit while driving home. The only thing that came to mind was that perhaps we would go to church together. And why wait? Are they going to try to talk her out of it? We will only be engaged. This doesn't mean we'll get married right away, but I wanted it to happen soon, just in case. The day passed slowly and hard for me. I was afraid it was all too good to be true, and I didn't sleep well at night. Partly because I could smell Katie's scent on the bedding, I felt more alone than I ever remembered. Sunday has arrived. I called. I wanted to make sure I wouldn't be late. I expected to hit the road before 9 a.m. in order to be in time for the service, but it turned out not to be so. I was invited to one o'clock in the afternoon. Of course, I arrived on time. I was met at the door by Jackie. She had a pleasant smile, almost disarming. I felt cold, imagining the worst. I was shown into the living room where Katie and her father were waiting. As we all sat down, Jackie asked, Now, Martin, why are you here? I looked at Katie and realized how much I wanted her in my life. Her absence last night was still too vivid a memory for me. I have come to ask your daughter to marry me, Mrs. Biss Taylor. Jackie smiled. You have our blessing, just like yesterday. Do you want some privacy? As if on cue, the two came out. I walked over to Katie sitting on the couch. Her hands were on her knees. The right hand covered the left. I sat down next to her. She turned, changing the position of her legs slightly, and her knee touched mine. I looked into her beautiful green eyes and asked, Katie Taylor, will you be my wife? I had a box with a ring in my hands, and I opened it, and I was surprised. All that was left inside was the wedding ring. I looked back and saw Katie holding her left hand with a ring on her finger. She kissed me and whispered, Yes, yes, and please don't be mad when you let me see it. I just had to wear it, and I'm glad I did it because I felt so lonely last night. I was afraid that Mom scared you away. There were tears in her eyes as she finished her sentence. We hugged for a few minutes before Jackie appeared at the door. Can we join you? When they returned and sat down in the chairs across from us, Jackie smiled at her husband. He smiled back and extended his hand to take it. She had a twinkle in her eye as she began, I see the answer was yes, but I knew this would happen. The only one who doubted was Katie. She thought I might be too demanding. Having said this, she smiled at Rick. She's not the only one who thinks I go overboard sometimes, but he always lets me have my way. Yes, and I want to thank you both for your understanding. I will do my best to make your daughter happy. I'm sure about it. I knew you were right for each other at first sight, Martin. I tried to bring you two together, but failed. But since you found each other on your own, this only confirms my opinion. Now to the situation. Are you saying that you have dishonored my daughter, Jackie said, raising an eyebrow. Yes, and I apologize to you and to her. Mom, this is our business, Katie said, blushing. Rick simply smiled and shook his head. Jackie had no intention of stopping. Are you afraid that there might be cause for concern? Please, Mom. Katie, you agreed that I could speak my mind. So, do you have any reason to worry? I felt my ears get warm and my hands sweat. Where does this all lead? Yes, madam. In a fit of passion, I didn't. And then I found out that Katie wasn't using birth control. You are absolutely right. Katie was never on birth control or anything like that. And I'm proud of her for that. But you must not have used protection, as they say. Her father sat in his chair, rolling his eyes and shaking his head. But he still held Jackie's hand. No, madam, I didn't use it. You said you love my daughter and don't want her to be disgraced? That's right, Mrs. Taylor. As I said this, Katie kissed me on the cheek and rested her head on my shoulder. As she did this, she extended her left hand and raised her fingers up, looking at the ring on her finger. Jackie's face lit up. Martin, she's been looking at that ring since you left. She picked up her ring and looked at him, 
then at her husband, but I think I know why, because it symbolizes your love and her devotion to you. Now, where did I leave off? Yes, I want to offer a solution to your problem or possible problem. If you want to honor my daughter for the gifts she gave you, you can do so by marrying her immediately. Yes, Mrs. Durs Taylor, we will do it as soon as we can arrange it. This is true. What if I can arrange it today in this house? I couldn't believe my ears. Today, I turned and looked at Katie. She had a slight frown on her face. She pulled me close and whispered, we don't have to. I looked at my future mother-in-law. Can you do this? Yes, I can, but it will be your decision. I don't insist, I just suggest. I smiled. Does this mean we can sleep together tonight without shame? Martin, you can sleep together anyway, without shame, as far as we know. Katie, are you ready to take a chance today? I mean, you can change your mind. I just wanted to give you some time. Martin, I am your woman with or without this ring. My heart belongs to you. I just gave you the rest of my body on Saturday morning. I turned. If it's not too hard, I'd be happy to get married today. Jackie looked at her husband. She smiled as if she was very pleased. She made the call, and we waited. As we waited, my future mother-in-law explained, Today's wedding was my idea. I discussed this with Rick and then with Katie. You see, I'm selfish. I want Katie by my side. She is my only daughter and my only remaining child. She left and lived in California for five years. She just returned to us. She arrived about a month before you, Martin. Like I said, I'm selfish. I want Katie to put down roots here next to me. I want to see her happy and for her to give me grandchildren. This, Martin, will require your efforts. Katie is 33 years old and... Mom, you so... shouldn't tell everything. I'm your mother, Jackie said matter-of-factly, and that gives me some privileges. As I said, she is 33 years old, but with the right man, you, Martin, she has time to give me several grandchildren. I should have had about ten of them by now, but that didn't happen. But then you have not come into her life until now. She waited, and I think she was wise. And I will say, young man, that if you impregnated my daughter by your actions on Saturday morning, I would not be the least displeased. Mother. Honey, let's give them some privacy. Rick led her away. I got the impression that it was not for strong words, but to enjoy personal time. The priest did arrive within a few minutes, and in less than an hour Kathy became Mrs. Martin Raymond Jameson. Just as we were about to leave, my father-in-law stopped us. Jackie was next to him, holding his hand with both of hers. He gave me the package. It was a week at the Imperial Hotel in the city center, and this was the wedding suite. It's the least I can do, considering Jackie insisted on it, he smiled. But he wasn't angry in the least. We spent a week of complete bliss in the suite. It was a penthouse, and there was an indoor heated pool and jacuzzi. I won't go into detail about what we enjoyed as we continued to consummate our marriage, but I will say that no part of my bride's body was left unexplored. My fingers and lips touched every inch of her skin, my nose smelled her body mixed with her perfume, my eyes absorbed all her beauty, I memorized her voice and confessed my love many times. I'll tell you about one case. Late in the evening we were naked in the jacuzzi. It was snowing. We opened the glass doors to let in the cold air. We drank champagne while enjoying the water. Katie said she loved the snow and got out of the hot tub. She called me under the light snowfall. I reluctantly joined her. After a few seconds of watching her dance naked in the snow, I felt a chill. I commented that my little friend was almost hidden. Katie laughed and said she could fix it. Like I said, the week was fantastic. Jackie ordered all of our meals and the staff called to find out when we wanted them to be served. The first dinner was lobster and oysters. There was a postcard with him. I opened it. It was a postcard with a note. Just to keep you going, it said. She signed it and drew two beautiful eyes. Both had long eyelashes, but one was closed. She winked at us. My first week back, my boss called me into his office. I wondered what I had done. Jackie was waiting for me there. 
Martin, I want to talk to you and ask you for a favor. I will do everything possible. I want to ask you first, then Katie, I know what Rick will say, but everything will depend on you. I was waiting. My mother-in-law turned out to be full of surprises. I want to ask your permission to have a big wedding reception for you and Katie. I frowned. Please listen to me. She is my only daughter. Rick and I didn't have a wedding. We eloped and got married. We had no money and my father didn't like my choice of husband. We started from scratch. Rick earned everything we have. He has achieved a lot. So please let me arrange the wedding for you. And if you agree, I'll talk Rick into getting you another week or two at Imperial, or a trip to Hawaii if you want. I could see that it meant a lot to her. I smiled. I'll let you and Katie handle this. She came up to me and kissed me on the cheek. I will achieve my goal. I'm her mother. I know how to use guilt. Thank you, Rick. You are amazing, and I couldn't be more proud of the man my daughter married. She turned to leave but looked back at me. Did I tell you I'd be an interfering mother-in-law? Everything was decided, and the wedding was to take place on our six-month anniversary. While we waited, we enjoyed family life and explored all the delights of marriage. We moved into Katie's apartment and left mine. We saved everything we wanted because we were going to buy a house. This was part of our plan to take root. The day came, and we were going to get married again. During the ceremony, the pastor gave a short speech. Friends and family, we are gathered here today for a special occasion. But what some of you may not know is that this is just a confirmation of their vows. Six months ago, I had the honor of pronouncing Martin and Katie man and wife. They wanted to be together and not bring shame on their family. Now you know, let's get started. The wedding was great, and we got another week at the Imperial. I found out that it cost my father-in-law quite a bit of money, but not as much as Jackie spent on the wedding. But they were happy, and we were happy to support them. After the event, we moved into our own house. I got home just as Katie was answering the phone. Jameson's residence. Well, hello, how are you? I'm glad you didn't have any problems with the number. It's on the list. Sorry to hear that. I only heard one side of the conversation. Yes, I'm glad you understood that. Oh, it wasn't that difficult or expensive. Yes, I just wanted you to know. And I'm sorry that I somehow forgot to send you an invitation, but I included it in the package. Yes, photo. Yes, really. Is that what you're saying? Postcard, yes, I thought you should know. In fact, you were the first to know about it. Martin has just arrived. Do you think I should tell him? This is true? Well, well. We have a lot to talk about, so I'm going to have to hang up, Connie. Call again, it's always nice. Well, don't say that, I was a prefect. Yes, I understand how you feel, but I really need to go. Martin looks at me with sleepy eyes. Who was that? I asked, dumbfounded. Just Connie, whatever her last name is. Katie smiled as she dialed the number. What are all the area codes for Houston? Within a minute, all calls from Houston were blocked. What was it? Katie smiled at me. The bitchiness just came out again. Are you angry? No, it seems to have been aimed correctly. But what was it about? At this moment, the dryer alarm went off. I have things to do, but come on, I'll tell you. She went to the laundry room, taking the envelope with her. It was something like a greeting card. In the laundry room, she pulled the clothes out of the dryer and placed them on the table. I wanted to get her attention, so I picked her up and sat her on the dryer, facing me. Now tell me what's going on. I just felt bad that we didn't tell Connie about our wedding, so I sent her a small package today via FedEx. I didn't expect her to receive it today, but it doesn't matter. Carry on, my love. In the package was a newspaper clipping about our wedding. Well, the ceremony. Mom really described everything beautifully, didn't she? No distractions, I teased. I sent the remaining invitation with her name on the envelope, explaining that it had simply gotten lost. And I sent a photo of you and me at the altar. I hope there are no voodoo queens in Houston. She'll pay them to turn me into a toad. I do not believe in this. 
I also put one of each color of napkin in there with our names on it. And finally, I put in a card. Like I said, I plan for her to receive it tomorrow. Which postcard? Katie handed me the card she had taken with her. I opened it. It was an announcement of the upcoming birth of a child. I read it. I was supposed to be a father. As I read, I learned that Jackie bought the cards the day before our wedding. Sorry, I wanted to tell you first. She just called before you got home. I didn't care. I wanted my wife. I made love to her right on the dryer. As we finished and caught our breath, a thought occurred to me. You know Connie will see the ceremony date and due date and think we should have gotten married. What do we care about this? We know the truth. But it does not matter. And besides, the truth is not important to her. She's unhappy, and I helped her with this. I just want to rub what she lost on her nose. Later that evening I had a thought. Should I send a thank you card to Ann Baxter? Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.